Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. I was uh, just practicing my call. Today I bring you the last part of season one of The Eminence in Shadow. Check out the other parts if you want to watch chronologically. Anyway, when we last left off, Princess Rose has fled the capital after stabbing her betrothed, causing a stir all over the kingdom. Beta and Alexia contemplate Rose's reasons for sudden violence while she runs around in the sewers. They decide to tread lightly and begin collecting more information regarding her fiancé and Oriana Kingdom's circumstances. Beta, of course, was making sure that Alexia wouldn't just run off and cause trouble. She allows Shadow Garden to drip feed more information to Alexia to ensure she remains cautious, then receives a report indicating that Rose is becoming a meatball. Meanwhile, Sid reflects on his mission to be dramatic, while Skell goes further into debt. He then runs into a suspicious elf babe looking for someone of her own kind. She bears a resemblance to Alpha. Sid lies about his connection to her and is given an impromptu strength test. He fails on purpose. The strange elf introduces herself as Beatrix while fondling his hand. Anna Rose and Quentin, the thuggish fella, discuss mundane man's absurd fight from yesterday. Neither Neither of them know exactly what happened, but Anna Rose suspects that he moved with impeccable agility. They both eagerly await Mr. Man's duel with Goldie Gilded, who retains his win streak by cancelling fights against opponents he can't beat. The two warriors take their stances and begin their bout. Goldie's strike is deftly avoided. Everyone is shook. Goldie is enraged. He unleashes his ultimate kill move, Demon Fatal Strike, Golden Dragon Blade. It is parried by a sneeze. The Golden Dragon is incapacitated. Quintor remains in disbelief while Anna Rose practices the sick moves she just witnessed. Somewhere within the royal palace, Perv Asshat has increased security measures and subtly insults Iris's capability. The king is clearly under Saruman's dastardly spell. Iris is politically outmatched despite being an aristocratic punching bag. Meanwhile, Mundane Man continues to produce overwhelming victories, while Skell frantically writes to call upon Poe for additional gambling funds. In the arena's empty hallways, Anna Rose rolls for intimidation. She fails, as Mundane Man tosses aside his 347-ton training weights. She tries again by displaying the prowess of her mimicry, but fails again. Later that night, in the sewers, Princess Rose fights off her pursuers. Sid contemplates one-liners to use during the tournament. When Skell attempts to sucker him into bounty hunting for gambling cash, he succeeds, only because Sid would rather flee from his sister's overprotective grasp. Skell and him split up to look for clues, as Sid reflects on how punk rock stabbing her fiancé and running away is. He is most interested in Rose's inspiration for poking and eloping. The succulent sounds of Moonlight Sonata echo into the streets, causing him to have have a flashback to learning how to play the piano, and the resulting metaphorical happenstances which contribute to his goal of being the eminence in shadow. Becoming a skilled pianist only adds to his cool persona. But Moonlight Sonata shouldn't exist in this world. Upon investigating, the artist is Epsilon, who figured out how to play by watching Sid. She has been performing plagiarized classical pieces to the upper nobility on the side, much to Sid's disappointment. He inquires about Rose's whereabouts and marches forth after making sure to compliment Epsilon on her figure. Devious thought acquired. Meanwhile, Beta and Alexia wander into the labyrinthian bowels of the capital. While discussing Oriana's king's suspicious vacancy, Rose appears to be having a fair bit of trouble. She reflects on the events leading up to her evacuation, specifically recalling the devious faces of the nobility and her father's derelict appearance. Her decision to assault then abscond was out of anger and desperation to protect her father and homeland. She thinks of Sid as she fondles the remnants of the sandwich given to her. Unfortunately, her dreams of marrying Sid and slaying Perv are beginning to turn into a meatball, along with herself. Suddenly, the somber echo of Beethoven's Sonata No. 14 bewitches the tunnels, calling to Rose like the Pied Piper. She follows a trail of feathers to find Shadow dramatically performing within an ancient chamber. Shadow uncovers her motives and offers her power to protect her kingdom. Rose passionately reveals her determination as Shadow wraps her in a purple flame, dispelling the meatball curse. He provides her with advice on handling the strength he gave and vanishes. Some cult freaks arrive for some reason, but they are transformed into sauce by Rose's newly infused power. Meanwhile, Alexia and Beta find Rose, who has suddenly become stoic and mysterious. Despite Alexia's pleas for information, Rose is determined to keep her in the dark. They duel.
Rose defeats her after they bounce around a bit. She apologizes to Beta, who is understanding. Beta wishes her well, and they part ways. Sid is pleased by his excellent performance, but unfortunately, despite deliberately staying away from his house all day, is greeted by Claire. Claire is enraged. She strangles Sid for not following through with his promise to visit their homeland during summer vacation. She threatens him with one last chance by giving him an invitation to observe her fight from the reserved seating during the finals of the Bushin festival. Meanwhile, Beta has moved out, bestowing the gift of knowledge to Alexia, who is unenthused. Back at the arena, festivities are underway. As Sid makes his way to the ultra VIP seating area, he encounters Iris, who is a friend of Claire's. She apologizes for the trouble Alexia has caused him, and begs for his forgiveness. Not that it was necessary. They discuss the tournament lineup, mentioning Anna Rose specifically. Iris points out another warrior who isn't competing, the elven swordmaster, first champion of the Bushin Festival, the war goddess Beatrix. We've already met her, and we've run into her again. I'm pretty sure that she finds Sid suspicious, but I don't actually know. They trade sandwiches like true homies, then part ways. While Sid was away, Perv slithers into his seat next to Iris and begins to flirt as Anna Rose takes the field. They aristocratically argue about who gets to recruit her first. Iris subtly sends him a death threat by flexing her kingdom's military supremacy, which I thought was clever. The fight between mundane man and Anna Rose is analyzed by the two royals and begins. Anna Rose feels like she understands her opponent, but upon seizing an opportunity, she finds she was mistaken. Mundane man delivers a potent counterattack, earning Anna Rose's respect. She hits a defensive stance, but mundane man possesses inhuman agility. The fight is ended at that moment, much to the crowd's displeasure. The victor makes his way out of the arena as mysteriously as he entered, while Iris fawns over his perfect swordsmanship. She begins to suspect Mundane Man in light of his skill and her assumption that Shadow Garden is involved. As Perv departs the VIP section, he instructs his minion to investigate Mundane Man to ensure he won't be a threat to his schemes. In the bowels of the arena, Mundane Man and Anna Rose become homies. As Scale is gracefully escorted out of the festival, Anna Rose is inspired. Sometime later, Iris kills this poor guy and her sword. Beatrix observes and eats sandwiches. She is interrupted by Iris who is deflected by her autism. That evening, Sid is pleased with the progress of his Bushin festival goals and reveals his plan to defeat Iris, then disappear. Unfortunately, he forgot to watch Claire's match and will likely be flayed and eaten alive. Iris has a flashback to her days as a prodigy, flying through her life as a knight and recalling the grand expectations placed on her. Despite her self-doubts about her power in comparison to Shadow Garden, she also hallucinates her father scolding her for recklessly attempting to invest investigate the Church of Divine Teachings. Iris is determined. The next day, Sid and Iris discuss the proper way to have coffee. When Beatrix arrives, she is swarmed by nobles, but is only interested in Sid. The gentry begin to place doubt on her strength after her analysis of Sid, who is appreciative of her lax disguise. Meanwhile, Perv squirts his evil juice into King Oriana and reveals his plans to use Rose to acquire a nondescript special key while committing regicide. He remains suspicious of mundane man after having found no information about him. Beatrix calls the king smelly and invokes Perv's wrath. Her name inspires fear, however, causing him to ideate additional assassination opportunities. Sid goes to the toilet as Claire wins her duel. The time has come for Iris to duel Mundane Man, her most formidable foe. She remains confident in her strength and takes her position. His bloodlust immediately sends her instinctively flying. Despite this, she moves forward only to realize that the entire arena is within his striking range. Rose in infiltrates the arena with the help of Shadow Garden. Iris hallucinates her defeat a few times from fear while the crowd begins to lose confidence. She goes Super Saiyan in response and is immediately defeated. The king is disappointed. Perv is shook. Beatrix is infatuated. Rose waltzes into the VIP section. She apologizes for everything that happened and will happen, declaring herself as the king's daughter and the princess of Oriana. She is forgiven, then kills her father. Perv is shook. Right before Rose takes the easy way out, mundane man leaves leaps a hundred feet into the air through the glass window of the reserve seating, slices the assassins, and reveals himself as Shad. I mean, Rose reveals him to be the stylish bandit slayer. Everyone is shook. Rose fanboys super hard while recalling her first encounter with him, then apologizes for being weak. Shadow inspires her to continue the fight. Perv calls for his guards, but there is no answer, except for the war goddess, who just wants to fight Shadow, probably. The residents of the city are spooked. King Midgar begins precautions for the inevitable 
onslaught of political fallout as Perv makes a hasty retreat. Shadow and Beatrix exchange a few blows. He totally outclasses her by teleporting around though. The war goddess expresses her frustration at not being able to detect Shadow. When Iris butts in with an enchanted mithril blade, a powerful artifact, raw power is hardly enough to stand toe to toe with the imminence in Shadow, and the fight escalates into 2v1. Claire is hunting for Sid, while Rose is approached by Shadow Garden. Shadow's fight continues around the capital, as the clash of blades and bars causes an unfathomable amount of property damage. Rose is given two choices, fight alone or alongside Shadow Garden. To save her kingdom, Alpha declares she must prove to Shadow Garden that it is worth saving. She pledges her fealty on the spot. Meanwhile, Iris is pissed off. Shadow and Beatrix introduce themselves. Shadow runs around on some water, vampire style, while Iris throws fire everywhere. She is ultimately kicked in the face. Beatrix takes over by shattering one of Shadow's crowbars. Impressive. Unfortunately, Anna Rose has been stood up and somehow goes unfazed by the total destruction of buildings surrounding her. Beatrix has adapted to Shadow's teleporting. As Iris goes for the screaming sneak attack from behind, she is parried by Shadow's fist. They stare at each other for a few seconds as the women form a rough plan. Iris goes for the tackle move but gets a knee to the face. This allows Beatrix to charge up a strike, which is effective but countered. Both of them are stomped on. As Shadow attempts to leave, Iris scolds him for causing damage to the capital, which is kind of stupid considering she was part of that destruction. I get that she means the incident from before, but wantonly spewing fire everywhere also isn't a good look. She declares Shadow to be the enemy of the entire kingdom of Midgar, threatening him with nowhere to run. Of course, Shadow doesn't care whatsoever and begins to laugh maniacally at the thought of running, after which he makes a gigantic purple sphere over the whole capital and hovers menacingly. Alexia has yet another existential crisis while practicing her swings. Shadow decides to vaporize the capital in a gratuitous display of force. Just kidding, he ran off. Iris understandably has a mental breakdown. Sherry catches wind of the news from the capital and adds another picture to her serial killer goon cave. Perv is scolded by some authoritative figure, probably a knight of rounds. Beatrix comforts Iris with words of wisdom before departing via train. She never did find her relative, but is content with experiencing Sid. The ladies of Shadow Garden continue to do their own thing behind the scenes, tying up loose ends and growing their ventures. Skell has managed to get shanghai or became a fisherman, or got lost somewhere, I'm not sure. There's a foreboding white-haired beast lady on board with him though. Rose has found her way into Baron Kagano's land and is guided to Shadow Garden's hideout, the ancient city of Alexandria. Rose is handed over to Lambda, assigned comrades, given the number 666 as her identifier, and is stripped naked. The dissected ribbons of Sid's sandwich wrapper cascade through her fingers and up into the night sky as Rose begins her new New life as a recovering meatball. Shadow practices for the next time he has to play a piano in a labyrinth while reciting poetry to himself. And that's the end of season one of The Eminence in Shadow. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe. I've got a Patreon for those who want to give me McDonald's or booze. I'll get around to doing season two within the next few months probably, so keep your peepers peeped. Anyway, that's all. Bye.